Well, hey everybody, uh, just glad to be able to be with you, even though we're not together as we would all like to be. Uh, we thank the Lord for the ability to use technological mediums like this to be able to connect us together and to continue to study the Word of God together. Um, I'd like for you to open your Bibles, uh, if you have them near you, to Colossians chapter 2. And we're going to be studying a pretty short passage uh, today, which is Colossians 2, 6 to 7. Colossians 2, 6 to 7. I'd like to read that really quickly, and then I'll pray, and then we'll dive in. Colossians 2, 6 to 7, reading from the New American Standard, says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted, and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us. Lord, you didn't leave us without a word. You have revealed yourself to us in Christ, and you inspired men to write down the divine record so that we could come under the teaching of your word, Lord, and be saved and be grown in Christ. And I pray that as we study your word together, that you would reveal yourself to us in a powerful way. And that Christ would be honored and exalted and magnified in us as we study together. And I pray that your spirit, Lord, would give us the illumination that we need so that we would understand and apply your word correctly. Lord, give us the mind of Christ. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's a universal truth that what you believe determines what you do or how you behave. That's axiomatic. That's universal. And that has uh, not been seen in such a stark way like we've seen it recently as we've seen people that have believed different things about this pandemic of the coronavirus and that has caused them to act in differing ways. Some people have believed that because of this virus and the pandemic, there would be a lack of food. And you see this in their actions because people have gone to the store in search of large quantities of food and even products. And yet others, on the other hand, have believed something far different about the pandemic, that it's not necessarily a huge threat, and they've continued on with their lives, just as normal, even continuing to congregate together. And I only say that just to prove the, the point that what you believe really de does determine what you do. Uh, wh whatever you take in, or whatever you think about something will determine the way that you react to it. And this is even more certain and true when we talk about what we believe about God. Because what we believe about God does not just affect the way that we react in a pandemic. What we believe about God affects everything we do in all of life, from birth to death, and even in, into eternity. And I think that's potentially and, and, and uh, most assuredly what Paul is getting at here in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. You guys know very well, uh, as we've talked about uh, throughout Colossians 1 and even up to this point in Colossians 2, 6, that Paul has been giving instruction. He's been given doctrinal instruction on who is Jesus Christ in the context of a church that was plagued by heresy and what has he done for us. And yet I think Paul would say to us, I did not give you that instruction simply to, simply to uh, bring into focus the, the, the error of this heresy or, or to teach you how to deal with it. Uh, that's one reason, undoubtedly. Uh, I don't think that he gave us this instruction simply to fill our heads with knowledge, even though what we know about Christ is so vitally important. I think he's saying I'm, the, the end of all of this is I want you to see who Christ is and what we believe about him so that that affects the way that you walk in this life, which is precisely what he says in Colossians 2.6. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. What you believe about Jesus should affect the way that you behave. The doctrine that we affirm about Christ should alter the way that we walk in this world. And I think Paul is aiming at that here. And I would remind you, before we really dive into this text and see two central parts, that this is a critical text. It's almost a hinge text in the book of Colossians. Uh, this comes as a sort of a summary of uh, what started in the section that started in Colossians 1.15. 
We'll talk about that in just a second. But this also comes before the start of another section in Colossians 2, 8 and following. In Colossians 2, 8 and what follows, Paul deals almost in a frontal attack on this heresy that it was plaguing this church. Of course, he's dealt with it to some degree already. But he's going to dive in in a frontal attack. And yet you know that from Colossians 1.15 to this point, Paul has dealt again with the doctrine of Christ. So it is as if to say in this text, Paul is saying, before I move to talk about this heresy, I want to remind you again, if you've believed everything that I have said up to this point, now walk in that even in the face of opposition of these heretics that I'm about to, I'm about to put on a frontal attack against. You guys have the responsibility not merely to believe this, but to walk in it. Such that you would be strengthened in the face of the winds of doctrine that are against you. Now what I see here is Paul dealing with two main ideas as it pertains to walking in Christ. One is the way in which we should walk, which I think we'll see in Colossians 2.6. And the other we could define as the why of walking, the way of walking and the why of walking. Now I say the way of walking because again of what Colossians 2 6 says. It says, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. In other words, the way that you should walk in Christ is the same way that you received Christ Jesus the Lord. Now I want to remind you, in order in order to know how we should walk, we should ask, well, how did we receive him? Because Paul says you should walk in the same way as you received him. Well, the word received here, paralambano, really refers to receiving instruction or doctrine. This is why Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 7, the succeeding verse, he says, Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, watch this, key point, just as you were instructed, uh, presumably by Epaphras and also by Paul. Uh, this is similar to what Paul said in Colossians 1 7 when he speaks of their receiving the gospel. And he says, Just as you heard it and learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. You guys remember that Epaphras is the one who planted this church and obviously the first one that instructed them in the gospel. Now, the idea is you all have received Christ Jesus the Lord according to our instruction. In other words, it's, Paul is saying the true Jesus is the Jesus we preached, and that's the Jesus that you all have received, unlike the Jesus that was being preached by the heretics. This Jesus that supposedly in his spirit left his body before he died on the cross, in effect denying the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus Christ. Paul says that's not the real Jesus, the one they're preaching. The one you all received is according to our instruction, according to the doctrine that we imparted to you. And so the question is, who is the Jesus that Paul and Epaphras instructed them? Obviously, we've already seen this, but it is worth our time to read again in Colossians 1, 13 to 20 about who is this Jesus. Because Paul says, Colossians 1, 13 to 20, for he, Jesus, rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Paul says, that is the Jesus we preached, that is the Jesus you received. So the way that they received Jesus is according to the Jesus that they were instructed, the true Jesus, according to the true instruction of Paul and Epaphras. You guys received, Paul said, the Jesus who is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, and head over the church. You received Jesus as the Christ who purchased you through his death what the heretics were denying. You received Jesus as the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's the Jesus that you received. Another way you could say it is what Paul says in Colossians 3, 3. He says, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now watch verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, 
then you will also be revealed with him in glory. Who is this Jesus that you received? How did you receive him? You received him as your life. And therefore, Paul says, if that's the way that you received him, if Jesus Christ is your life, the Lord of heaven and earth, the head of the church, Messiah who purchased us, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, if you've received him as your life, then walk in him. Which means, don't change what you believe about him, regardless of what people are telling you. This is the truth. And it also means that our behavior ought to correspond to what we believe about him. What we have received about Jesus ought to determine and define how we behave. And one question that we should ask ourselves continually is, is what I'm doing in everything I do, is what I am doing in this moment consistent with what I believe about Jesus? If Jesus is preeminent, then worshiping something else isn't consistent. If Jesus is three times holy, then watching something on TV or in a movie that profanes his name is not consistent. If Jesus is all sufficient, then taking something from somebody else because you need it to satisfy you is not consistent. If Jesus is preeminent in all things, then giving our lives for the sake of him to see others one for his glory is consistent. What we believe about him should determine what we do. And yet, I love what Paul says right here at the end of Colossians 2, 6. He says, just as you received, or therefore as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk, watch this prepositional phrase, in him. That's so key. If you've received Jesus as your life, it is as if Jesus is the sphere in which everything you do is conducted. You walk almost as if the life of Jesus is a bubble around you, it infusing everything that you do. It is as if somebody takes you and throws you into a sea, and that sea is the life of Jesus, and every part of you is wet with the life of Jesus. And Paul says, if that's true about you, then the life of Jesus will influence every single part of what you do, as well as give you the power to do it. It's reminded me of 2 Peter 1 verse 3, in which Peter says, seeing that his divine power has granted to us, watch this word, everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. He has given us everything, his divine power, by, that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. This is so key, Paul says, as you've received him, and we've received him this way, we believe what Paul says about Jesus. So Paul says, then continue in that. Don't change what you believe about him, regardless of what anybody tells you. And also make sure that all of your actions are consistent with what you believe about Christ. And yet Paul doesn't leave us there simply, simply telling us that we should do this. Uh, he doesn't give us simply the way of walking, but he also gives us the why. If you look at verse 7... He says this, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. Now, the way Paul wants to motivate you, the way he wants to give you the why of walking is by showing you what God has done in you, in Christ, and what he continues to do as a result of that right now. He says, and I want you to pay attention to three key words here, having been firmly rooted, first word, and now being built up. Second word, in him, and established, third word, in your faith. Now you need to know, uh, as, as part of uh, uh, understanding the grammar here, that these three words are participles, and they are passive participles, which means this is not something that we are doing. This is something that is done to us by God. This is something that God is executing on us, an action that he is taking on us. So I want you to focus right here on the first one, which is having been firmly rooted, which is a really good translation of this, because rooted is also in the perfect tense. It's a passive participle in the perfect tense. You say, well, I didn't come to a grammar lesson. But it's important because the perfect tense means it's something God has done to us that has continuing results until now and forever. I'll say that again. Perfect tense means something God has done to us that has continuing action or continuing results until now and 
forever. Now look at what he says. We could, we could translate it this way. Having been firmly rooted by God with the present result of being built up and established in your faith. And we'll get there in just a second. But the word firmly rooted, this idea really is the idea of being planted as a tree. This sounds very similar to what the psalmist says in Psalm 1, 1 to 3, when he said, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Watch this, verse 3. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. It is as if God planted us like a tree, like Psalm 1. He has firmly rooted us beside the river, and the river is Jesus that infuses us with constant nourishment so that we produce fruit and we thrive spiritually the way he has called us to. You could also use the similar image that Paul has in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. He says, as he's praying for the Ephesian church, that he, God, would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, watch this, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love. God has literally planted us in the love of Christ that has no bottom. And as your roots go deep into the river that is Jesus, and as your roots go deep into the love of Christ, you are receiving from him nourishment to become what God has planned and is causing you to become. Because if you look at Ephesians 3.19, he says all of this is so that we may be filled to all the fullness of God. Wrap your mind around that. He wants you to be as full as God is. How full is God? infinitely full. So what God has done is he has taken us and he has planted us in Christ and Christ is the nourishment and he is the love that fills us to be as full to, to all the fullness of God. That's an amazing thought. And yet the, what, what, what the result is of this is maybe even more amazing because I told you that the word uh, rooted or having been rooted is a perfect tense verb, which means it has results that continue to today and even forever. And actually those results you find right here in Colossians 2, 7. It's the other two words that we, that we mentioned. Uh, look at it again. Again, this is a good translation. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith. Now again, that's something God's doing to you, but that's present tense. What, what, because of God rooting us in Christ, the result of that now is twofold. He continues to build us up in Christ and establish us in our faith. And that's something that he does now and forever. Now, the idea of being built up actually is a change of imagery. Paul has been talking about being planted as a tree. But now he transitions to talk about this image of a building. And he says literally that God is building us up in Christ. And the idea is that as our roots go deep in Jesus, God is literally building us brick by brick so that we become the holy temple in the Lord that he has purposed us to be. Now I say, I say that because of Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, verses 19 to 22, Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. If you've got your Bibles, I'd like for you to see this as this is an extremely key text. Paul says to the Ephesians, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling of God by the Spirit. That is what God is doing to us. 
We are positionally in Christ, the temple of God. And yet what he's doing as we grow in him with roots going deep in Jesus, as he is putting brick upon brick upon brick, every victory through his power in the Christian life is another brick that he is putting on there. Every time we pass through suffering and we do it trusting in Christ, it's another brick so that we become this temple that he has called us to be and that we are in Christ, that we become practically what we are positionally. And yet, he, uh, he says, as you are being constructed in that way, there's something else that's happening to you. You're being established. Now, this idea of being established or confirmed in your faith literally is the idea of having inner strength. It is as if God is saying, as I'm building you up as a temple, I'm putting steel rebar in the middle of it so this thing doesn't move. This, is, this refers to strength in the inner man. It's the same idea as we just have already seen in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, when he says that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened, watch this, with power through his spirit in the inner man. It is this building that God is putting into place with steel rebar in the middle of it so that it doesn't move when the winds of this world and of false doctrine and of satanic attack and assault come against us so that we're not moved away from the hope that we have in Christ. Very similar to what we see in Colossians 1.23 when Paul says this, If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast, and watch this, not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you've heard. The end of all of this, and I just want to remind you, in Colossians 2, 7, he says, being built up in him and established in your faith. The, the reality of this is God only does this in Christ. Outside of Jesus, none of this happens. And that's the message to the Colossians, and that's the message to us. The reason Paul says, now walk in Christ, is because none of this happens outside of him. He not only is the river, it's not only his love in which we are rooted, it is this whole sphere in which all of this building happens. Because apart from him, it doesn't happen. And the end of all of this is 1 Corinthians 1.8, in which Paul uses the same word as he does in Colossians 2.7 for the word established. 1 Corinthians 1.8, he says... Who will, talking about God, will also confirm you, same word, confirm, establish you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God wants to make you strong so that you don't move away from the hope of the gospel because he has a purpose in mind. He wants you to arrive at the end saved, blameless, without stain, without blemish, so that you stand before him in Christ. He says, that's what I'm doing. It is quite similar to what we see in Isaiah 41.10, where God said through the prophet Isaiah, do not fear, for I'm with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. Watch what he says, I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's that confirming word. Paul says, given everything that God has done in rooting us, and everything that he continues to do in building us up and establishing us, why, why, why would you not want to walk in Christ? And now the only logical response to this is what we find at the end of Colossians 2, 7, which is the only participle that's active he says, overflowing with gratitude. That's your part. That's my part. I don't root myself. I don't build myself. I don't establish and confirm myself. I don't present myself before him blameless. But in Christ, my response to all of this is not to do it myself, but rather to give thanks that God is doing it in me in Christ when I don't deserve it. He says, overflowing with gratitude, which I take to mean in every possible circumstance and situation, you are still in a moment where gratitude is the necessary response and the appropriate response. You might remember in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that Paul says this to the Thessalonians, 
1 Thessalonians chapter 5, a verse that uh, we could certainly all do well to memorize. He says, Rejoice always, 1 Thessalonians 5.16. Pray without ceasing in everything. Watch this. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now church, given the fact that we have received Christ Jesus the Lord, in that same way, Paul says, continue in him, walk in him. May all of your behavior be ordered by what you believe about Jesus. Oh, let that be true of us. Let that be true of us. And let us be motivated to do that as we remember the fact that God has rooted us deeply by the river in the love of Christ. And we are, being, we are being filled up as we're rooted to all of the fullness of God. And as we are rooted in him and as a result of that, he is building us up and he is establishing us so that we would remain in Christ because he wants to present us holy and blameless before the throne. And oh, what is the necessary and appropriate response? Simply to say this, God, thank you. Thank you. And Lord, help me to remember that. When it's tough, when I'm in opposition, and when life does not make sense. Help me to stay in Jesus. Lord, guard me here. Because here is where my life is found. I'm going to pray and give thanks to the Lord for his word. And I ask that he continue to do this in us as he confirms us. Father, I give you thanks for our church family, for Comunidad en Cristo. God, thank you for the opportunities that we have together to study your word and let your word wash over us. And Lord, as we've studied your word, I pray that you would do the work that only you can. You said my word does not return to me void, but it accomplishes the purpose for which I sent it. So I ask that you would send your word this morning and that your word would do the work in us, Lord, of uh, establishing us and confirming us and reminding us that we've been rooted in Christ so that we would continue to walk in him. And Lord, I pray that this would produce people who are so after Jesus that their lives look holy and different. Lord, I pray that we would be the salt of the earth as we have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Let us walk in a way that corresponds to what we believe. We ask you this in Jesus' name.